now that we know how to determine the charge of various ions, now we can look at take that a step further and kind of talk about writing formulas for ionic compounds. So again, whenever you have a metal um, transferring electrons to a nonmetal, right? Those electrons are going to be moved from one to the other. Um, ionic bonds are going to be formed. So an ionic bond is going to what, what holds together these ionic compounds, which are formed by a combination of cations, which are the positively charged ones, which are come from the metals, and the anions, which are the negatively charged ones that comes from the nonmetals. So the idea here, kind of the main take-home point is probably this part here, is that the sum of the charges in an ionic compound must add up to zero. And the idea here is we're going to use subscripts to talk about how many of each ion are there so that whenever we add up the charges, the, number, the amount of positive charge has to equal the amount of negative charge, and that's going to make it add up to zero. So in other words, if you have a plus three charge, you have to have a minus three charge. If you were to take plus three plus negative three, that would add up to zero. And we do that by using subscripts, which identify the number of particular ions that are going to be present. Whenever we write the actual compound, we always write the metal first and then the nonmetal. Okay, so here is an example. So you have magnesium and fluorine. So looking at the periodic table, we have magnesium down here, which is going to be a plus two charge. So the way we know magnesium is a plus two charge is because of the group number two, right? Any metal is gonna have the same charge as their group number. Or you could say that magnesium would have to lose one, two electrons to get like the noble gas. Remember, you can imagine the noble gas kind of being over here right next to column one. So if it loses two electrons, it's going to have a plus two charge. Fluorine is over here on the periodic table. It's a halogen, meaning it's going to have a negative one charge, right? Remember, eight minus the group number, um, or you could just remember all the halogens have a negative one charge, or you could say, in order to get like a noble gas, all of the halogens, like fluorine, are going to have to gain one electron. Okay, so now that we know that magnesium has a plus two charge, and fluorine has a negative one charge, how do we balance that? Well, we're going to need two times two of the fluorine, right? So if you have two fluorines, that would add up to negative two, and that would balance out your positive two. So that means we need two fluorines to balance out the magnesium. So the way we would write that final ionic compound, we would write Mg for magnesium, F and then a subscript 2, and that subscript 2 tells us there's going to be two fluorine ions in there. So in other words, you could imagine that this magnesium is a 2 plus, and then associated with it would be a fluorine that's a negative, and then another fluorine that's a negative, right? So you're going to have two F minuses and one Mg2 plus. Okay, so let's do a few more of these. So this might be a good time if you're watching the video to pause it, try to answer all these, and then come back and see if you can get the right answers. All right, so first one, sodium and bromine. So for sodium, we can find that on the periodic table here. That's Na. So Na is going to be, or sodium is going to be plus one, right? It would have to uh, lose one electron, so it's going to have a positive one charge. Bromine is over here. Um, I'll do this one in red as well. That's going to be a minus one charge. That's a halogen, uh, just like fluorine was on the previous example. So whenever they have the exact same charge, we don't need subscripts because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So we would write the compound as just NaBr. All right, so that's the first one. So now let me go ahead and erase on the periodic table just to keep things neat here. Um, and let's do barium and oxygen. So barium is going to be Ba, and that's down here on the periodic table. So barium, it's in group two. That means it's going to have a plus two charge. So that's right, plus two here. Oxygen is over here on the periodic table. It's in group six, or six A, right? That means eight minus six is going to have a negative two charge, right? In other words, it would have to gain two electrons to be like a noble gas. 
So just like the first example, they have an equal charge. So it doesn't matter that those charges are two. We still just write it as barium with an O, B-A-O. Um, okay, so let's do the next one. Again, let me do a quick erase here for calcium and chlorine. Calcium here in green, right, is going to have a plus two charge. Chlorine is another halogen. It's going to be minus one. So chlorine is going to be a minus one. So in this case, it's very similar to the one we did on the previous slide. You have a plus two and a minus one, which means we need to have two chlorines to balance it out. So what that means is whenever we go to write this, it's going to be calcium and then chlorine that has a two. So CaCl2. And then the last one here is going to be potassium and nitrogen. So potassium is one of the trickier symbols. So remember, potassium is going to be K. So that's going to be a plus one. Write this one down here. Nitrogen, N, that one is three away, right? So if we said it would have to gain one, gain two, gain three electrons to be like a noble gas, so it's going to be a minus three. So in this case, we're going to need three potassiums in order to balance it out. So in this case, it's going to be K for potassium, three, N, all right? Um... Let me make up one more because I think it, it might be helpful here. So let's do um, magnesium and nitrogen. And nitrogen. So magnesium, if we look at magnesium, erase these, even though I guess I could have left that one there. Magnesium is going to be plus two and nitrogen is going to be minus three. So the reason I wanted to do this one is, is the numbers don't quite work out perfectly. You can see for magnesium, if we were to, we know we have more negative charges than positive. We were to do one to one. So that means we need more negative charge. So that means we're gonna need multiple magne magnesiums. But if we just put two magnesiums there, that gets us to plus four. And then we're gonna have more positives. Then we're gonna need another nitrogen, which would get us to minus six. So basically in this case, a common trick is just to um, crisscross the numbers. In other words, magnesium had a plus two charge, so that two can just go over here. And then the nitrogen had a three charge and it goes there. And what you can see is you end up with plus six and minus six. So it just takes a little more math to balance them. Um, but in the end, you're gonna get magnesium three, nitrogen two. Mg3N2. Um, you got to be a little bit careful whenever you do that crisscross method. Um, you want to make sure that you always have kind of like if you think about fractions and how you would have like the lowest common denominator. Like you can't have it where you, both of your subscripts here can be further simplified. So in other words, your subscripts have to be in their simplest form. And one example for that would be if you go back up here to where we had barium and oxygen. Um, we just wrote it as BAO. If you had crisscrossed the numbers um, and wrote BA2O2, let me write this down even though it's wrong. If you had written BA2O2, right? In theory, that would be a plus four charge for barium and a minus four charge for oxygen, and that would work. But that's not the most simplified form of that. So that one is wrong that way. You want to stick with the most simplified form, which would just be, in this case, BAO. All right, so in terms of naming cations and naming ionic compounds, so we need to name the cation, then we name the anion. So for naming the cation, you just say the element name. So Na+, plus, we just say it is sodium, K+, plus, potassium, so on and so forth, calcium and magnesium. For the anions, we change it a little bit. You may have actually noticed this in some of the earlier slides, just in the way it was written, but the suffix gets and change to IDE or IDE. So bromine goes to bromide, chlorine to chloride, oxygen goes to oxide, sulfur, sulfide, so on and so forth. 
So we're going to change the naming of the element to have the suffix "-ied", and then we're just going to simply name the cation and the anion. So sodium and fluoride come together to form sodium fluoride or magnesium chloride. Now notice, even though there's a 2 here for magnesium chloride, we don't, we don't say that 2. We don't say magnesium 2 chloride or magnesium dichloride or anything like that. We don't need to do that because as scientists, we know that an ionic compound has to have the charge balance. So if someone says magnesium chloride, we know that there has to be two chlorines there to balance off the magnesium. So because of that, we don't specify how many of each there are whenever we're naming ionic compounds. And this is going to sound pretty simple now, if just to say one name and say the others. It gets a little more confusing whenever we get into naming covalent compounds, because for covalent compounds, we actually do go in and name um, these, super, or these subscripts. Um, so basically, if I just tell you to name a compound, you have to first figure out whether it's ionic or covalent and then use the correct naming rules. But again, we'll do some practices on that once we learn how to name covalent um, compounds, which comes up in a later lecture. But for now, for an ionic compound, you name the cation, then you name the anion, and nothing more than that. All right, so let's do a couple practices. These should be really straightforward. Um, C, A, and O. You would just call that calcium oxide, and that would be it. MgCl2 would be magnesium chloride, same example from the previous slide. LiBr, lithium bromide. So again, these are naming the cation, then naming the anion, and we just leave out the, the charge. And the one thing to notice here is at the ending of all these, the anion has the ide. So we always name the metal first. That one's going to be the metal. And then the nonmetal comes second with the ending of ide. The naming can get a little bit trickier whenever we go into the transition metals. And that's because if you remember, um, I said that for all the transition metals, you should imagine that they can have a variable charge. So because they can have a variable charge, we need a different way to name them so that we know what the actual charge is. So on this slide here, I show two different methods for naming it, the systematic way and then the common way. Um, we're not going to worry about the common name. I just want to mention it very, very briefly, just in case you hear it, you'll have some idea of what that means. Um, the systematic name is much easier. Um, the idea here is, so these, this, these are always going to be metals, so basically you're going to name the metal, so iron, right? Fe is iron, so we're going to take iron, and whether it's iron 2 or iron 3, we're just going to name it iron. And then we're going to use, in parentheses, a Roman numeral to say what the charge is. So for instance, this one here, we would refer to this one as iron 2, and this one we would refer to as iron 3 where that 2 or 3 refers directly to the charge. Now, for the common name, um, basically you use endings of OUS or IC, and the idea being that OUS is always going to have a smaller charge than IC. So the reason the common name is a bit trickier is, one, you would have to know that iron can be in a plus 2 or plus 3. You have to know the various potential charges and then name it accordingly. Um, and if you're wondering why iron has the prefix of F-E-R-R, -R, it has to do with kind of, um, well, this, the whole reason that iron got the symbol of ferrous is because its name in a different language is ferrous, uh, so, or ferrum. So it's basically kind of how it was named. So for the common name of iron, it would be kind of tricky on a few different levels. So again, we're not going to worry about the common name. Um, and I just want you to focus on the systematic name uh, for naming it. So again, in that case, you're naming the metal, and then you're going to name um, the charge with a Roman numeral in parentheses right after it. So um, for copper, right, copper 1, copper 2, chromium 2, chromium 3, tin 2, tin 4, for instance. 
So what does this look like with some problems? Like if we say, give the name for CuCl2. Well, Cu is copper, so we would write the name of copper. And because we know copper is a transition metal, circled on the periodic table down there now, anytime you have something with a transition metal, we have to say what the charge is going to be. And we're going to put that in parentheses. Well, how do we know the charge of copper? Well, we have to use the other information given to us to figure it out. So CuCl2, we don't know the char charge for copper. However, we know that chlorine is negative one, and we know that there's two of them. So that means from the chlorines in total, we get a charge of negative two. So guess what? That means that the copper has to be plus two. So for copper to be plus two, we're going to put a Roman numeral two there, and then say chloride. So copper two chloride. And again, you can't just say copper chloride because there's also a copper that has a charge of plus one. So we have to specify what that specific charge of copper is, and we do that with that Roman numeral. And you figure out the Roman numeral based on the anion that's there because for the anions, they don't have a variable charge. We always know the charge of our anions based on where they are on the periodic table, right? So for here, for chlorine, we know chlorine's always going to have a negative one charge because it's one away from the noble gas. Okay, next up, write the formula for iron three oxide. So for this one, write iron three oxide. So that tells us that the iron has a plus three charge. Oxygen, let's go ahead and circle our ones of interest here. Iron and oxygen. So iron has a plus three. We know that because it says iron three. Oxygen is negative two. Right? So oxide's negative two. So now to write the actual formula, we're going to do Fe for iron. We're going to need two of them. That's going to give us a plus six total charge from those two. And then for oxygen, we're going to need three of them. Right? And that's going to give us minus six. So Fe2O3. That would be iron three oxide. And again, that's different than say iron two oxide, which would just be FeO. All right, so again, whenever you have a transition metal in there, you have to do that one extra step of making sure that the charge is clarified.